The following presentation is sponsored by the Cleveland Clinic. In virtually every society on earth, the child is cherished, loved, nurtured, and protected from harm. But when the child becomes ill, injured, or suffers from a devastating disease, families are tested to their limit. Parents are stressed beyond description. It's at those times when the search for a top-notch, state-of-the-art, high-tech as well as high-touch resource for children begins. If you worry, we'll take real good care of her, okay? Grandpa loves you, honey. That search often ends here, at the Children's Hospital of the Cleveland Clinic, a place where pediatric patients have been a vital part of this world-renowned medical community since it opened its doors in 1921. I've been here for a long time, and what I've seen is that we've taken the best of what the Cleveland Clinic has to offer and apply it to children. Put that in an environment of research and education, high technology, and the state-of-the-art care, I think we have elevated the care of children at the Cleveland Clinic to where it should be, and that really is at the top of its level, both locally, regionally, and really worldwide. I'm Monica Robbins. Welcome to another edition of Medical Miracles, a unique series shot entirely on location at the Cleveland Clinic. This episode takes us behind the scenes of the Children's Hospital. We'll tell the stories of patients ranging in age from a few hours old to a young teenager. In between, we'll witness some incredible surgeries, share poignant moments with families, and we'll see emotions bared as tears flow freely. But we'll also see medical miracles right. performed on a daily basis. Stay with us for Medical Miracles. We knew there was something wrong summer of 2000. She had taken a mild fall off the swing set in September of 2000. Hannah Moses was just six years old when she fell from her swing. Her parents, Greg and Marlene, took her to several doctors near their home in Stowe, Ohio. They found that her fall had fractured a vertebrae in her spine. Hoping the injury would heal on its own, Hannah was sent home. By November and especially December, we knew there was something terribly wrong when she was losing her ability to control her legs. Hannah's a normal kid, and kids take tumbles all the time, but things got kind of scary when she began to have trouble walking. That's when Greg took things into his own hands. When she continued to get worse, Greg decided that he was going to, on his own, call the clinic and get an appointment up there. The Cleveland Clinic got Hannah in quickly. The date was January 4th of 2001. She was scheduled for a battery of tests. She came to us with complaints of bilateral or both leg weakness, back, severe back pain, inability, actually an inability to walk. It didn't take long for the test results to come back. I first met Hannah in the hospital. I was one of the nurses that originally um, took care of her when she was diagnosed. Um, and I was there the night that her family and she found out that, that she did have cancer. So that was a, a really rough night. I remember when the horrible night, I still remember January 5th when Dr. Friedman came and said she had cancer. Um, he said, um, Chris, I freaked out and we were in the room. He had pulled us outside of the room and told us this and he said, you know, he said, she, you will all be stronger for this. He says, she'll get very sick before she gets better, but you will all emerge much stronger and you know, you'll, you'll get through it. And so those words kind of stuck with me. That was a, a really rough night. But Hannah was a trooper and she never showed her fear. She was just an amazing kid. The tumor had wrapped itself around her spine and so it was literally swishing it. And that's why she was losing her ability to walk. These children are beautiful kids who you know that they are suffering, and you know that what you are going to do is to get them out of their suffering as quickly as possible. So having that immediate goal in mind is what drives you along. The Children's Hospital at the Cleveland Clinic provides a tremendous support system for families and patients. The hospital can draw on enormous resources to get children through those tough times. Close to 100 pediatric specialists and subspecialists at the main campus alone provide the sort of innovative, state-of-the-art care for which the Cleveland Clinic is known. But there are many more areas from which families can draw strength. We help children to kind of learn about what it's like to be in the hospital, learn about what's going to happen to them on a level that they can understand. Hey, Timmy. Hello. 
Timmy is just six years old. He too is battling cancer. One of the many ways children and parents are helped through tough treatment regimens is by a service called Child Life. We work to help children cope with the emotional and the developmental effects of hospitalization and illness. I worked quite a bit with Hannah and she was very overwhelmed with a lot of information that was being given to her about her tests and procedures and her new illness. And Hannah, she really benefited from doing a lot of medical play. Hannah was started on intensive chemotherapy. It was tough on everybody. Early on, we had to just do things, and that was our mantra. We don't have a choice. We have to do this, you know? And I told Hannah, I said, I will be there every second with you. So I spent, you know, every night in the hospital with her, and every day there, I didn't leave her side. Greg and Marlene were very united, and that's so important, not only for Hannah, but for the family, for Hannah's sister, Aurelia, and for the treatment team, too. You know, knowing that we could rely on them both. Greg and Marlene are Catholic, and they've put their lives in the hands of their God. Early on, Hannah showed she was a very gifted and bright child, so they thought the best way to educate her was homeschooling, and that's what they've done. Marlene works out of their home as a music teacher, and Greg manages a multi-state communications business there as well. We could spend as much time as we needed to with our children, and um, I think it was, it was God's way of getting us ready for this last year that we've been through. It gave us an awful lot of flexibility to homeschool uh, both our children and both of us working out of our home. This past year for the Moses family has been a whirlwind of visits to the Children's Hospital at the Cleveland Clinic. Friends, family, and a supportive medical staff have made Hannah's year of treatment possible, but the first month was truly difficult. In January, we spent 21 days of the month in the hospital, so it was, that was really shocking from that standpoint, and then we would come home for a week, and we'd be back in for a week. And that's the way it went. Month after month, the treatment went on. But Hannah's courage started to surface, and that's really something to see in a six-year-old. She really tried to take a lot of control over what was happening to her. So she, she tried to help other kids see what was, that it was okay, what she was going through, that she was able to, to deal with it. She was having scans and tests and biopsies at all hours of the night and day in the beginning. Um, she was very sick. They had to literally t just wheel her from one room to another. She didn't, she didn't walk. Before Hannah was diagnosed with cancer, Marlene and Greg had ordered a cello for her. She had taken music lessons from her mother, and now it was time to move her into her own instrument. Hannah's illness seemed a signal that she wouldn't ever be able to play. I just kept looking at the box that it came in, and I said to my husband, I cannot bear to look at that cello, because it was a reminder of what we should be doing, could be doing, might not be doing type of thing. But Hannah made it easy for her mother. She wanted to start playing. And she picked it up with a passion. When she started playing again, it was like she couldn't get enough of it. Couldn't get enough of the piano either. Uh, and she just loves it. I think the music has brought so much joy to her It was life. a real healing. It was healing for both of us. Marlene even conducted classes at the hospital for Hannah to satisfy her hunger for music. We started playing and then a nurse came in one time and said, wow, you play the cello. Can you come out into the hallway and play? Sure, you know, so we bring the cello out there and they've got babies and strollers and, and swings and things like that. And they line them up in the nurse's station and Hannah gets her cello out and starts playing for them. It seemed like a natural thing to share this with all these other kids who didn't feel like doing anything. And it just worked out really well. Last summer, Hannah played the national anthem at an Indians game with her Suzuki group. It was another triumph for this little fighter. Hannah's tumor was intertwining around her spine, so surgery was out of the question. The chemotherapy had to continue. By March, the months of treatment were starting to pay off. All signs were positive. Tests showed the tumor was shrinking, and a decision was made to discharge Hannah. But the emotional roller coaster continued. It was March 16th. I remember it very well. Hannah was being discharged from the hospital, and um, uh, the nurse came up and said, Dr. Levian wants you to stay here for a few minutes. He's coming over. And Marlene got this look on her face like, because the day before we had an MRI, and Marlene got this look on her face like, oh no, what's he coming to say? And he came over and he said, it's gone. The tumor just melted away. It's completely gone. 
and I, it was like this light came and just started shining on us and I, it was one of the happiest days. As bad as January 4th and 5th were, March 16th was good. Hannah continued with her chemotherapy and every three months she comes in for a checkup. We have a, a CAT scan and MRI. She also has periodic um, echoes to check heart function, bone scan. She'll have an x-ray of her spine because we worry this first year off of chemotherapy is when there's a higher possibility that the cancer could recur. So we just want to check that and we just pray. You know, I go there just, my heart's saying, I want this, I, I want to have these scans done, but you know, here we are looking for this cancer that tried to kill my daughter, you know, and so it is, it's a very mixed emotion. The continuing tests take a toll on Hannah. Each round takes a whole day. In the case of her MRI, she had to lie perfectly still for two hours. And then a few days later, the family comes back to find out the results. As Dr. Levian opens the computer to check on the tests, Marlene anxiously waits. The tension in the room is tangible. So everything else is normal, absolutely clean. That's the MRI, we had a CT to it, yeah. And that's clean too. The CT. Yeah. Everything is totally clean, 100% clean bill of health on x-rays. There we go. Congratulations. And everything else is going to be normal. Oh. Everything else is going to be normal. Just a few weeks before this visit, Hannah had asked to celebrate her seventh birthday with her hospital family. This was a very special day for Hannah. It was the day after we decided to stop her chemotherapy. She had completed a about 11 month intensive course of chemotherapy and this is a celebration, major celebration for her. January of last year, we all, you know, wondered, you know, is Hannah gonna have a seventh birthday? So that was a huge milestone for us, for her family, for Hannah. She spent her whole year with them and they really are our second family. I mean, I, I, I love them. I love the doctors and I love the nurses and they are absolutely our heroes because they just, I mean, they saved her life. Intense research, much of it done here at the Children's Hospital, has given young patients like Hannah the chance to survive devastating diseases. And it's the recognition that children have special needs that adults do not encounter that leads us to our next story involving a teenager from the hills of West Virginia. For that story and more, stay tuned to Medical Miracles. It was hard at first because we didn't know what the problem was. We thought the worst. She was losing weight. Her blood count had gone down so low that we were very concerned. Marlene and Jerry Maley of Grafton, West Virginia, were terribly concerned about their daughter, Rachel, who was 11 at the time. She had symptoms that included abdominal pain, diarrhea, and she'd begun to pass blood during bowel movements. That was two years ago. They began to search for an answer as to what was ailing their normally outgoing daughter. Between the time we took her to Morgantown and uh, the West Virginia University, took her down there and didn't find out for sure till we, yeah, it was pretty rough because we didn't know what was wrong. Physicians at the Children's Hospital at the Cleveland Clinic often have to deal with patients searching for answers to complex medical problems. Fortunately, with so many pediatric specialists on hand dealing with hundreds of medical conditions affecting children, the Maley's finally got an answer. We were lucky enough that when we went to the clinic, Dr. K right away said, yes, this is Crohn's disease, so we didn't have to wonder for a year or two, like a lot of kids do, what this disease was. We knew right away what it was and started treating it. It's an advantage for our patients because we have a big experience with it and therefore we're using the latest medications. Uh, we're from, you know, and we're familiar with all the um, sort of rare uh, complications of, of the disease. Crohn's disease causes inflammation in the small intestine, usually occurring in the lower part. The inflammation extends deep into the lining of the affected organ, causing pain, diarrhea, and rectal bleeding. It's difficult to diagnose, but seems to run in families. It can be a devastating disease, especially for someone like Rachel, a normally outgoing child. I say she's a lot like her dad, <laughs> personality-wise. She laughs at everything. Nothing seems to bother her, and when he does, it's very traumatic. 
but the disease was affecting Rachel's life dramatically. Rachel's always been a very good student, grade-wise. When the disease was first diagnosed, she missed a lot of school. She's always had a lot of friends. She sort of shied away, I think, at first from everybody because she was a little embarrassed about it. To her surprise, Rachel found her team of doctors and nurses at the Children's Hospital in Cleveland very tuned in to what a teenager might be going through. It's normal. We really try to make sure that the um, kids are participating in normal activities. And, and that's part of our visit with them. We ask about what they're doing, are they going to dances, how their boyfriends are, all, all the regular stuff too. For Rachel, her nurse, Becky Abood, has become a close friend with whom she shares her concerns. I loved her from the minute I met her. Just we bonded, we talked right after her um, appointments. They called on the phone with questions, which is normal, you know, through the whole diagnosis process. Many Crohn's patients may eventually require surgery to remove the disease section of intestine. However, in most cases, drugs are tried first. I remember her first infusion. She had a traumatic first couple of ones just because she was nervous, didn't know what to expect. But we've worked through it, so that also kind of helps along with the relationship. She just calls on a personal basis, not, not because she needs to call to check up on her, but just to say hi. Rachel emails her a lot um, through the internet, and, and uh, Dr. K has been wonderful. Becky's the best nurse ever. The Maleys have even come to accept the four-hour drive from West Virginia they have to make every five to six weeks. The four hours is not bad knowing that you have all the confidence in the world in your doctors and nurses. Um, it's a good time just to get away, though, just the two of us. Not worry about little brothers. Rachel's disease is now under oh, control. Yeah. Her friends at school know all about her condition, and Rachel even gave a talk on it in class. Her old confidence is evident. Right now, Crohn's disease is, uh, once you have it, you always have it. We don't have a medicine to make it go away. But the new medicines that are being developed are really allowing our patients to lead really very normal lives. As usual, the Cleveland Clinic doesn't stop looking for cures, no matter the disease. We do have a number of research trials in, in pediatrics, um, in uh, pediatric gastroenterology, and a number of other areas also. That's what amazed me when we first went up there was, to, to us, it was traumatic. There's something wrong with our daughter. You know, we were all nervous and, and anxious to find out what it was, and to them it was just, we deal with this a lot, you know. And I guess that kind of gave us the confidence in Dr. K and the other doctors to know they do. They, they, they deal with hundreds of these, and, and we're just one case. Next on Medical Miracles, we'll witness one of the most remarkable surgeries you can imagine. Little seven-month-old Elizabeth D'Amelio was born with just one pumping chamber in her heart. We'll see one of the world's best pediatric heart surgeons, Dr. Roger Mee, and his team of specialists undertake a remarkable surgical procedure to help give her a normal life. Stay tuned. Yeah, I had five sonograms during my pregnancy. Um, they said everything looked normal. And we thought when she was born that, you know, she had 10 fingers and 10 toes, she was healthy. At her two-week checkup, we were told that she had a heart murmur. For Chrissy and Maurice D'Amelio of Girard, Ohio, that examination was the start of a long journey that's still not complete. Their daughter, Elizabeth, was born May 1st, 2001. Chrissy noticed a problem very soon after she came home. I noticed that she would start breathing, have moments where she would breathe real fast and it was really labored. And um, her pediatrician said not to worry about it unless it lasted over five minutes. And if it lasted over five minutes, I was to take her in immediately. Um, and so it did it. On Memorial Day, she was breathing really fast and hard all day long. The next day at an Akron hospital, Elizabeth had an echocardiogram done on her heart. The cardiologist knew right away what was wrong. And then they life flighted her over to Cleveland where we talked to Dr. Preminger and then she explained her heart problem. When she first came to us, she was a month old and she was in a severe congestive heart failure. It was shocking. And heartbreaking. Basically, Elizabeth's problem is that she was born with one pumping chamber, whereas everyone should have two pumping chambers to their heart. And um, because she has one pumping chamber, um, all the blood has to mix 
together before it chooses to either go out to the lungs where the blood get ox gets oxygenated or to the body. It was necessary to stabilize Elizabeth immediately and a coordinated approach was launched that included Dr. Preminger and Dr. Roger Mee, a pediatric congenital heart surgeon. Hearing Dr. Mee's name made Chrissy very happy. I joined a support group on the internet and I mean there's people from all over the world and most of them have heard of Dr. Mee and have told me how wonderful he is and he's one of the best. So that makes us feel pretty safe. She had a hole at the upper part of her heart that was becoming too small. I did a procedure with a balloon catheter to enlarge that hole. Later that day, Dr. Mee took her to the operating room to put a band over one of her blood vessels to limit the amount of blood flow to her lungs. Um, and she was much improved. Elizabeth needed time to get stronger for her next operation, and she did thrive. At seven months, she was ready for the next stage. But going in, Dr. Mee thought of her parents and family, just as he does with all of his patients. He had to make certain those close to Elizabeth understood the odds. It doesn't take too much imagination to put yourself in the position of the parents and uh, begin to have some inkling of what they're going through. The terrible fear that something bad's going to go wrong. We're never in a position to guarantee results. We're very frank in our discussions with the family from the outset as to prognosis, risks of the procedure, complications. It doesn't make for a particularly happy pre-operative interview, but we feel quite strongly that this all should be done up front and it's clear that some are terribly, terribly anxious. Dr. Mee's team, including pediatric anesthesiologist Dr. Paula Bokesh, makes certain that the goodbyes are dignified, gentle, and thoughtful. Congenital heart defects are rather uncommon. At least eight of every 1,000 infants have a heart defect. That's almost 1% of live-born infants. Most of these children can be helped by surgery, even if the defect is severe. Elizabeth's operation to correct her defect is complex and challenging. You need the most skilled and experienced of surgeons to correct these problems. I think from a surgical perspective, Dr. Mee is one of the best heart surgeons in the world, so you can't do better and that, that's what you want because years of experience does make a difference. The more that you see and the more that you have seen does impact the outcome and there really is no room for error when you're dealing with a tiny baby with congenital heart disease. That's why a lot of careful planning goes into an operation like Elizabeth's. Working on a heart about the size of an infant's fist and doing such complicated surgery is exacting and exhausting work for all the team's members. Elizabeth's heart is missing the tricuspid valve, so she only has a three-chambered heart instead of the normal four. The only way the blue blood can go as it comes back from the upper body is to mix with blood coming back from the lungs. Children with this defect cannot grow and thrive normally. Dr. Mee and his team have to create new routes for the blood by closing off and rerouting several veins and arteries so that the patient's blood can be properly oxygenated. Finally, Dr. Mee steps back from the operating table. Thanks very much. Elizabeth is then taken to the pediatric intensive care unit, where she'll be monitored and cared for 24 hours a day by a team of experts. Our census of cardiac patients here is one of the larger ones in the country. We do somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 operations a year, and that's a pretty substantial number. We also do tend to get the more complicated cases, but we will see other types of uh, problems. We'll see children with seizures, bad pneumonia, blood and cancer type disorders, all sorts of things. Basically, we take all comers. Like every other heart patient in the pediatric intensive care unit, Elizabeth's case received daily scrutiny by a team of cardiac surgeons, cardiologists, and pediatric nurses all of them pulling their experience and talent to bring the absolute best care possible to their small charges. She's getting stronger every day. According to her parents today, she's back to the girl that they knew before, that she's smiling and she's eating, and I look forward to seeing her in a few weeks when she'll be home and back to 
the thriving girl that she was before her surgeries. Many components make the Children's Hospital at the Cleveland Clinic one of the leaders in pediatric care. One of the newer ones is the hospital's level three neonatal intensive care unit. To take care of babies in a level three intensive care nursery, um, not only do you need highly qualified, highly experienced, and highly skilled nurses 24 hours per day at the bedside, but you also need to have a range of other pediatric specialists, including cardiologists, surgeons, gastroenterologists, um, anesthesiologists, to really respond to any medical need that this child might have. But also meeting the needs of the family is something that's uh, very important to us. And I also can't think of very many other specialties that are as uniquely gratifying as presenting a family with a healthy baby. We'll be right back with a final word on this edition of Medical Miracles. We want to thank all of the families who shared their private moments and anxieties with Medical Miracles, and we found the courage exhibited by their children to be truly inspiring. And the context into which the staff here puts children says a lot about the care they receive. One of the values of the Children's Hospital uh, at the Cleveland Clinic is that we clearly focus on children as, as entities and as part of a bigger picture with their families as part of that, that entity. Um, children are not little adults. They have different diseases. They have different needs. Uh, the family relates differently to it. Uh, everyone is involved in the illness and therefore it takes a, a complete different orientation to the way we treat children and some of the tools that we apply. I'm Monica Robbins. Thanks for being with us and we'll see you next time on Medical Miracles. Bye-bye. Kent Moravec was a happy, healthy little boy. At 19 months old, it was like a light switch went off. He quit talking, quit interacting with us. For unknown reasons, Kent became autistic. His mother knew nothing of the disorder. It changes your life. You know, I lost that child, but I had to come out of that room knowing he was the same little boy that went into that room, but he, but he was different. For nine years, she dealt with Kent screaming up to 165 times a day, his form of communication. His behavior led to public embarrassment, and she found herself becoming reclusive. I wanted to hide. I just wanted, and, and like I said, it was like losing a child. His schoolwork showed no improvement, and then the Cleveland Clinic Center for Autism opened last year. We didn't know where to go, what to do. So with this opening up, it's, it's been, you know, actually a miracle for him. When Kent arrived, his development was years behind. Within a month, he was going to the bathroom on his own. Um, the screaming decreased. But within a year, the improvements were dramatic. And this is him writing his name. The center focuses on extremely intense one-on-one -on -one training. Kent, touch quarter. Woo, good job, Kent. They need a lot of attention uh, throughout the day in order to learn skills and maintain behavior and learn to be independent and good functional communicators. And, um, and so it really requires uh, quite a bit of labor intensive work. It is life threatening. He doesn't know, understand, um, he can't run out in the middle of the road when there's cars. He doesn't understand that, no, he can't leave with that stranger. I need medicine to help my child strive. Now that he's here, it's like somebody's given me that medicine. And I don't have to worry daily where he is. 
Monica Robbins, Channel 3 News. Eight-year-old Lauren Spradlin was diagnosed with a hole in her heart. It's in the wall between the two upper chambers, but it's not an uncommon defect. Doctors say it can affect nearly one out of five people. It's one of the more common types of congenital heart disease, but uh, usually doesn't cause much in the way of symptoms in young children. Until just a few years ago, open heart surgery was the only option for children with an atrial septal defect. But now, there's another choice, this tiny contraption known as a helix device. The way that this one works, you can see it's, it's kind of a flat disc, and how we can get it into the body is by maneuvering it like this, so that we elongate it in steps. The helix is inside a catheter that threads its way into Lauren's heart through the artery in her groin. It's a tricky procedure to get it into just the right spot. We move it across the hole, and once it's in the left side of the heart, then we can let it come out and form up like this. So that it makes a nice flat disc, and we can pull that up against the septum of the wall. And then what we do is consider it like that. The surgeon then lets the other side form up and pulls everything together, effectively closing the hole in Lauren's heart wall. Then we use ultrasound to make sure that it's in the right spot. There's no leaks. Then we can pop it off, release it off of this catheter. It will stay in Lauren's heart for the rest of her life. In many cases, tissue grows over the helix, virtually making it part of the heart. A few hours after the operation, Lauren's awake and eating dinner and getting autographs from those who may have saved her life. There you go. What a great patient. Ready to go. It's a big day for nine-year-old Casey Brown. I'm going to get to eat all the ice cream I can stuff down my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Peter Coltai of the Cleveland Clinic is preparing to take out Casey's tonsils. Tonsillectomy is probably the most common procedure performed on children in the United States. Probably about a half a million operations done a year. But Dr. Coltide doesn't remove tonsils the traditional way. His new procedure is getting worldwide attention. We'd had some uh, extensive experience using a um, technique um, utilizing the device that had been developed for orthopedic surgery for shaving cartilage out of knees. It's basically a little rotor-rooter type uh, tool that spins inside of a shaft and sucks in a little bit of tissue, cuts it off. With this new technique, the usual pain and long recovery associated with tonsillectomies are gone. The reason is the traditional approach exposes the underlying muscles of the throat, causing inflammation. Today, tonsillectomies are performed if the tonsils are affecting a child's breathing, sleeping, or speaking, and the procedure can correct those problems. Research shows infected tonsils can cause behavior and learning problems as well. This operation will have a profound impact on Casey's life. He's had problems with um, uh, behavior issues at school. He's uh, suffering also from, uh, uh, from attention deficit uh, disorder. And uh, certainly not being able to sleep or not getting a decent night of sleep uh, is contributing to that in a significant way. Victoria Rasnick was born 10 weeks early. She's a twin with a rare problem, a potentially fatal birth defect. Dr. Frederick Alexander is preparing to operate on his tiny patient. About one third of her esophagus failed to develop. So she has a huge gap between the, the upper and the lower portion of her esophagus. What we've done for Victoria since birth is to stretch the upper part of her esophagus. We do that by daily esophageal dilatations. This x-ray shows the ends of her esophagus are nearly together. With no connection to her stomach, a feeding tube's been keeping Victoria alive. She's doubled her one and a half pound birth weight, but this delicate operation she faces requires the utmost skill. The esophagus itself is very small. Um, 
It's about the diameter of a drinking straw, but a drinking straw that's been essentially cut into two pieces. Because the operating space is so tiny, Dr. Alexander must contort his own body for hours as he carefully attaches the two ends. This is the moment of truth. Finally, he finishes sewing together the two ends of the esophagus. His goal is for Victoria to be well enough to go home with her twin sister. Our hope then is that by preserving her own esophagus that it will function better so that she can eat by mouth and go home with her sibling. Her parents are anxious to find out if that could be a reality. Everything went great. Have a seat, relax. She's doing just fine. The two ends of the esophagus came together very nicely. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Maureen and Roland Mastandria have two biological children and six adopted ones, including 11-year-old Hallie. It's a close, loud, and happy family. You'd never guess that three years ago, Hallie was withdrawn with no interest in school or her family. She suffered from terrifying seizures. So I took her over to the pediatrician. He was very concerned. He did not want me to leave his office until I had an appointment um, at the clinic. Tests proved Hallie had epilepsy. Hallie had uncontrolled seizures involving her right temporal lobe. The frontline therapy is medication. Despite trying several medications, Hallie's seizures got worse. Her family was willing to try anything. The medication seemed to be taking a toll on her. We then asked um, her neurologist to tell us again about the surgery. She then, because of the nature of her seizures, had an evaluation which included the MRI scan. And the MRI scan, as you see, here showed an abnormality in her mesial or deep right temporal lobe. They decided to remove her right temporal lobe. Specifically, the region that was problematic was the inside of the right temporal lobe, which on this model is colored yellow. Hallie's odds look good. Similar patients are 80 to 90 percent seizure free after surgery. I looked at him and thought, you know, this man is not gonna take my daughter's life in his hands unless he felt so certain that he can be successful. I really, I really felt very confident with him. That was three years ago. Hallie's transformation was miraculous. Typically, once the seizures stop, uh, it, it's like uh, you know a, a flower blossoming, and the patients uh, generally uh, improve their performance in all, across all aspects of their life. It gave her a new life. Um, I mean, she's right in there with everybody else. It gave her the opportunities that she would never have had. 